Sylvia is an artist and philosopher whose projects include virtual reality, internet translation, video, and performances. And mm -hmm. Sylvia is going to be talking to us today through the magic medium of the owl um, about plant play. So I'll hand over to Sylvia and we will have all questions for Sylvia at the end in our QA session with all the panelists. So take it away, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, hopefully you can hear me. Um... Yes, we can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. I wish that uh, I could be there in Manchester with you. Um, right now, uh, currently out my window, it kind of looks like this. So we're dealing with the, the heavy cloud of wildfire smoke that has blown down from Canada. Well, maybe not like this bad. This is really more of a simulation. Um, but the iPhone apparently does such uh, a good job with imaging uh, filtering algorithms that it kind of makes the orange haze more of a mild gray fog, so you kind of have more realist sort of view of what it looks like. But um, it's interesting to see how these technologies are mediating how we see the world, um, and they're tuning in sort of the well-tuned processes these algorithms are doing to make the world look good uh, in the midst of uh, the climate crisis that we're in, and all the the, the reality gets filtered out. So uh, in actuality, it kind of feels more like uh, a scene from Blade Runner. Um, so, uh, as was noted earlier, uh, I am an artist philosopher uh, and assistant professor in the games program at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York, working uh, with technology and imagining alternate possibilities and relations. My philosophy itself is focused on computation and being, and what alternate forms of computation could be created, and in particular, thinking about computation through the lens of care. Part of this involves speculative imaginings of computational systems to provoke thinking about our interactions and relations with computation and the world itself. So as I was pre uh, preparing for this presentation, um, I thought back on some of my earlier works in virtual spaces. Um, one of the very first pieces that I did investigating um, VR uh, was a piece called Bitrock, which I made in 2004. And this, taps into something that James was mentioning in terms of uh, games preservation. The fact that all the things that we're working with, this digital technology, is based on physical material. Um, and bit rot itself uh, is a term that is created to talk about the, the uh, times in which like the storage medium um, of the data gets corrupted, degrades, um, and uh, decays. And so I was interested in sort of this idea of what does it mean for something to decay, specifically what does it mean for something to decay that's virtual? So uh, what is the materiality, the nature of the material and the effect of time? In the still life genre, the concept of decay is often represented uh, in the captured moment of life as in the memento mori symbolism in the Dutch Renaissance still life. In this piece, I created a simulation of flowers wilting and decaying, which plays over the course of two weeks. The second simulation is a decay that affects the actual material by progressively corrupting the meshes data. I made this, these flowers using XFROG, which is a procedural generation tool for highly realistic vegetation in games and animation. And the final piece is in VRML. Shout out to anyone who remembers this, a virtual reality markup language, um, which is, uh, also brings up some interesting uh, problems of the decay of digital artifacts. So I was reflecting on this and I was thinking really that there's this thing that I'm coming back to uh, that I was interested in with plants and computation and play. Um, and during the lockdown really started to reemerge in uh, my thought processes. So, you know, if we think about sort of uh, what is going on, we're like in the midst of a radical change in the way that we relate to the world. Ecologists and biologists have described the period of uncertainty and disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic as an anthropause in which human activity and movement have been reduced. This anthropause or rupture is a threshold marking a space of difference and indifference. It is a space that differentiates between exterior and interior, before and after but at the same time is both and other. In this threshold, there is also space to reflect on the anthropocentric thought that has held us, led us to this point, both in terms of human nature relationships around invasive species and global climate change in terms of social relations. 
In our slowing down in isolation, we have turned to the non-human through the companionship of plants. How might plants help us reassess our being in the world or being in, being with the world? Can plant thinking and plant being provide a new understanding of our own being? Plants have typically been situated in the background as things that are there, but not there. Despite the fact that they are a dominant life form on this planet, we forget about them. They are either objects for our use or objects for decoration, or they are rendered invisible. This has been called plant blindness. When we do see plants, it's only in their usefulness. When people left their offices at the start of the pandemic, they took out their laptops, they took their papers, but they left behind their plants. Photographer Ricky Adams created a zine titled, Don't You Forget About Me in August, 2020, which is a series documenting abandoned office plants. The pictures of the withered leaves are a stark reminder of how we don't really live in isolation from others, that we are in this process of coexistence. When we isolate the plants from their environment, they are completely dependent on us. In contrast to these images, we can look at another photo series that depicts human absence, not from office space, but from the urban landscape. James Griffion photographs what he terms feral houses, abandoned structures around Detroit, completely taken over by ivy, shrubs, and trees. This return to a wild state is driven by socioeconomic forces rather than the lockdown imposed by the pandemic. We nurture and care for plants in a garden or a pot on a desk, but we also keep them at bay. Both photo series are tied up in anthropocentric thinking because the emphasis is on the human. Despite the fact that these photographs are about human absence, they still conceive the world in relation to our presence. The plants are an index of our absence and their growth or death speaks to the specifics of human conditions. How can we escape thinking that is based on the human as a standard of measurement? Part of the limit of Adam's project is the need for the piece to be part of a human signification process. In order for meaning to arise in the photo, the plant must be a pointer, a symbol of the loss that we feel due to the pandemic. Meaning in the work is our interpretation, which then overwrites the plant's self-expression. The plant is a standing for the artist's voice. In The Plant is Present by Megan Vitek, frames this encounter as performance art. This piece is a play on Marina Abramovich's iconic The Artist is Present, which rethinks the relation between artist and audience. Abramovich's durational performance hinges on nonverbal communication. In The Plant is Present, Vitek replaces the artist with a potted plant, specifically Dracenia trispatia, otherwise known as the snake plant. The snake plant is a popular house plant because of its durability. It tolerates low light and infrequent watering, and it has the potential to remove toxins from interior air. Like Abramovich's piece, this is a piece about presence. But if Abramovich's project is presence with another person, Beatrix asks us to focus on being present with a plant and to think of the plant in a new way. It is not about the plant coming to us, but about us coming to the plant. By placing this piece in the context of performance art, the plant takes on the role of performer, no longer passive, but an active participant. This allows us to understand time, not through our human conceptions, but instead from the plant's perspective. Abramovich pushes the boundaries of what we consider performance by performing the action of total stillness. This naturally opens the way to considering the stillness of the plant as active performance. Both pieces also highlight the importance of silence. Too often, we focus on language as a means of conveying information rather than an expression of being. Luce Aragrace notes that, quote, science is a crucial for a being with, without domination or subjection. It is a first dwelling for coexistence in difference. It is, or it creates a place where we can finally, finally can listen to the other and not only register a message as a machine could do. Eric Gray alludes to the emphasis on the technicity of language, which renders us more similar to machines, focusing only on information than on experience and existence. The plant is present also recalibrates the hierarchical structure that our relations with plants are normally built upon. Vitex prompts us to reconsider the, our relationship to plants, creating situations of horizontal rather than hierarchical relations. In doing so, they suggest ways of changing our own thinking. Human bodies, plant bodies, and digital computer bodies are all defined by material constraints. 
The material constraints of the digital computer are the physical properties of electricity and silicon, while the material constraints of the plant bodies are chemical. Material constraints give rise to the capacity for differentiation in different forms. Computation is, in some sense, defined by the intermediation of the material constraints of the body and the computer. Adding plants to the mix allows us to contemplate the space of threshold, the moment of mixture and intermediation. The threshold then is a space of potentiality. Plants occupy the space of the threshold, so a computation that is based on plants is one that is a computation of the threshold and one that is a constant return to the points of flow of breath. That is the moment in which discrete and analog processes embrace each other. It was from this vantage point that I began a body of work that I'm calling plant play. I began first by looking at the various ways that plants were represented in video games as a way to rethink our conceptions of play and engagement with the world. As I mentioned earlier, this project is a response to the lockdown from the pandemic. Like many other people, the lockdown made me start thinking about plants and plant beings. And like so many others, I was turned, I was in some degree static, um, not moving, but a still being. I watched how people turned to plants during that time, the rise of interest in cultivating house plants and home gardening. And in addition, I also saw people turn to games for connection. So there are people tending their plants in Animal Crossing. Plants in all its forms became uh, a companion species for us. So my question then started at the beginning with sort of how are games creating or, or how are plants uh, being represented in games? How do we virtually represent these plants? Um, so in the next section, I'm going to look at some examples or show some examples of how we virtually represent plants in the games. And that these representations are a reflection of our own human plant relations in the world that we exist in. Um, so the first is as plants as environment or as an aesthetic. Um, this is a process of aestheticizing plants in which the plant becomes a background to human action, a process that is an act of separation from the plant's agency, focusing on the pleasure of the artist and the player. Um, so these images are from The Last of Us, and they remind me a lot of the feral houses that we see there. And there, the plants then are creating an affect um, that then we are interacting with in the game. So a question that I would start asking is, is there a way of co-creating with plants? Next, we see plants as a resource. We're looking at plants in terms of providing uh, for our health as food, as a magical medicinal herbs, as things for crafting ingredients. Um, so sort of similar to sort of, you have Skyrim and, and Legend of Zelda where you're there collecting these objects and, and uh, resources in there. Um, and through the process of uh, focusing on plants as a resource, we start to begin to think about plants in an instrumental way, valued only because they are useful. And so then a vegetable no longer is a vegetable, but becomes a crop, a commodity. And that leads us to games that are about sort of planting and harvesting um, sort of these uh, management simulations. Um, in this case, like Farm Bill and Stardew Valley. So in this way, this is also a representation of one of the more dominant plant-human interactions that we have. Um, but my question also comes from this, can we think of plants in terms of their needs and their health? And then we have sort of this uh, category of like tending to plants. So games that are all about sort of the care, the nurturing of plants. Um, in this game right here, we have sort of the tending to succulents and um, in their care and things like that. So again, can we move beyond just caring for them, but also contemplating sort of their needs outside of just life? Um, we can think of also as gardens as a way of being with plants. Um, and this has uh, been interesting um, as gardening kind of also leads to sort of the act of narrative and, and storytelling in which then creating and tending to gardens then also advances the narrative. Um, and in there we're thinking about uh, working with plants to create certain affects, to create certain relations with others in them. Um, and then we also have games in which we're looking just at sort of the life of a plant and looking at creating um, evolving sort of crossbreeding alien plants or sort of just the growth uh, ideas of plants. So a lot of times when we think of sort of the, the greater world, we think of plants as maybe not having sort of 
rationality like us or, or movement like animals, but they have this power of growth. And so games like that tap into um, that sort of relation that we have with plants and them. And from all that, then I started thinking about, well, what can we do to start rethinking or transforming some of our conceptions of play? And I think that uh, transformation and speculative imaginings is important for getting us to rethink sort of the possibilities of the future. Um, and so I started thinking about sort of plants and playing as a plant. Do we have examples of that? Um, and of course, we have sort of plants that we interact with that have some sort of agency within the game. So we have things like Pikmin or Plants vs. Zombies where they're there interacting with us. They can also be enemies or helpers or aid us in our, our quest. In there. Um, but we could also use games to imagine, to have a speculative imagining of what it might be to be a tree, to be one of these things. And so there's a VR game called Tree in which you get to have that experience of being a tree in there. And then we also have sort of games like Flower where we're imagining what maybe the plants are thinking or are imagining. So uh, in this game, we have sort of, uh, you're in the dream of the flower and you're playing as the wind and moving through a space. So getting closer to this idea of, of plant thinking and plant being in there. So all these kind of things really sort of drew me to the idea of creating little experimentations in which I'm playing with the different aspects of plant being and plant thinking. Um, and so in this one, um, kind of the, my first experience with sort of plants and video games is really sort of the Super Mario and the Piranha Plant. That's, that's to me, the first image that pops in my head when I think of plants and games, because uh, it was my formative year. Well, I 3D in here. And so I was thinking, if we think about plant being, um, I think uh, um, there was a game uh, scholar, Ida Toff, that was doing cross-species game design. And she had asked the question, like, what would a plant's avatar be? And immediately, I think of the Venus flytrap being playing as the piranha plant. Um, and then I thought, what would that look like? How would that be? Can I play with my plants so we can be collaborators in this world? And so I created this uh, system, this artwork um, that plays with uh, the Venus flytrap and the action potential electric signals that uh, the plant receives or, or sends out um, and hooked it up to a uh, recorder or sensor that then when um, the plant sends out, uh, has their hairs triggered by some sort of object, uh, sends out a signal that then I can respond to. In there. So um, the trap then is closed due to this electric signaling that the Venus flytrap does. Um, so in that, so uh, I have a, a very basic prototype in which uh, I can play as Mario and uh, when Mario jumps over the little piranha plant, it triggers a uh, sensor um, that then is attached to a servo motor that then moves a little uh, wire around the Venus flytrap and then hopefully it will close at the right moment and then uh, send a signal back to then respond to it. So a close up of that um, and touch the thing. So um, anyways, but uh, so this is the beginning of sort of the development of this project. Uh, it's slow going because plant time, plants react in a very different time scale. So play testing is maybe once a week um, in there to, to get it in there, but it's uh, the beginning for some uh, thoughts about the ways in which we can start to imagine how uh, we can relate to uh, plants and how we can change our relationship to plants and now. So uh, thank you.